I'm Aria Schwartz. And I am Rachel Galligan. And welcome to the Windsider Show, where it's all about the W. The Las Vegas Aces are your 2022 WNBA champions. But that won't stop some other teams from trying to steal the spotlight. We got new coach openings to talk about, so let's dive in. like our show please consider joining our patreon community it's patreon.com backslash windsider again that's patreon.com backslash windsider for less than a cup of coffee a month you can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the w and don't forget to see our amazing staff's written content over at windsider.com that's windsider.com the playoffs and the season for 2022 might be over but that does not mean our coverage stops we are a year-round WNBA outlet and that just means a different style, a different aspect of our coverage starts up today. Um, but hey, the 2022 season is over. If you're looking to get tickets for next year or for events during the off season, thanks to our sponsor, TickPick, you don't have to pay the fees. Use the link TickPick.com backslash Windsider. That's TickPick.com backslash Windsider for all your upcoming ticket purchases, WNBA, those other sports leagues, or comedians, musicians, all of that. Welcome to the Windsider Show. We have a WNBA champion. The Chicago Sky are no longer the defending champions. Las Vegas Aces are. Let's start it off with just a huge congratulations to the whole organization. Um, a, a, a team that what joined Las Vegas five years ago. Just to see the turnaround of this organization, this franchise, has been amazing. Um, me personally, I'm just so happy to see the hard work that we've seen from Chelsea Gray, uh, Kelsey Plum, Asia, Jackie. I mean, just a historic season for those players. Shout out to D'Eric Hamby. Um, and yeah, I mean, just just a, a crazy whirlwind of a, a game four. Um, Rachel, thoughts? Just really um, want to echo that. I mean, just really impressed with just the organization as a whole. Shout out to Bill Beer, Dan Padover. I mean... I mean, everybody in the front office who's kind of gotten this franchise to where it's at and the passing of the baton um, in the off season with Becky Hammond being able to come in and take over. I mean, <clears throat> I just kept thinking to myself, and I've already thought this multiple times, but it's like, man, this Las, Las Vegas is, sorry, Pickle is agreeing with me very much. Las Vegas has really, you know, pushed the envelope. They've really set the bar high. You know, like, like I don't know if it's setting the bar high or if it's just continuing to elevate you know and and if i'm another franchise in this league if i'm another expansion team that's considering you know jumping into this and and and, okay this is this is what it this is the blueprint you know what i'm saying i mean this is what it's got to look like it 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 no longer can look like some of these other organizations in the league we'll talk about here in a little bit Mm -hmm. i think you know in terms of ownership and investment and just everything that is being poured into this franchise i mean that's they're the pinnacle of it in my mind i mean and it's not just from a talent perspective it's just from everything the city the organization the ownership is pouring into it um and look how quickly they were able to get that done i mean it's just it's just top top tier across the board um and you know las vegas alone is single-handedly pushing the WNBA to be better. It's holding these other counterparts to be better, to elevate their game. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I, I'll, I'll clarify what Rachel's saying for our listeners. She's not saying play horribly like they were in San Antonio. So you get a bunch of first round for number one picks. Uh, and then many years later, win a championship. What she's saying is from the franchise perspective, the way that they've put the players and the organization first said, hey, we're holding this team I don't care if the league's not going to do this. I don't care if other teams aren't going to do this. We're holding this team to the standard of professional sports team. Um, and you got to give a lot of respect, a lot of love um, to the ownership, to the people in charge. Um, and like you said, bit, and honestly, uh, I know Bill Ambeer has been getting a lot of shout out, but Dan Padover, the person who was so much uh, instrumental in building this team to what it is and where they are today, uh, now currently serving as GM over in Atlanta and already seen a shift there. Um, real quick, I want to remind everyone, the 2022 WNBA champion, Champions merch is out. 
rep the 2022 champions. And thanks to the folks at Homage and Breaking Tea. They already got it out. I mean, that stuff, the designs were ready. They were waiting for it. Um, I got to see the both designs a little bit early, and it was really cool to see that. Use the link for homage, H-O-M-A-G-E dot S-J-V dot I-O backslash Winsider. That's H-O-M-A-G-E dot S-J-V dot I-O backslash Winsider. And for Breaking Tea, it's simple. BreakingTea.com backslash Winsider. It's breaking the letter T.com backslash Winsider. And we'll throw those in the show notes. Um, We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about game four a little bit, break it down a little bit Um, from my perspective. And I had to, if you live under a rock or you don't listen to our podcast or whatever, uh, second year in a row was unable to watch game four live. And I knew once it, once the uh, schedule came out that the season would be ending uh, uh, in game four, it's just how it works. Um, So I've rewatched, I watched the, the, the fourth quarter um, on a horrible, horrible Wi-Fi stream. Everything was cutting up and Rachel was kind enough to keep me updated. Um, But I rewatched it later last night and a little bit more this morning. And and, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, Rachel, because to me, it was like a very, very similar game to game one where Connecticut had all the chances to win it and they just kept shooting themselves in the foot. And that's not to take away from what the Aces did. I mean, great teams find ways to win. Um, The Aces took advantage of the 50-50 balls. They took advantage of their opportunities um, and they really, you know, carpe diem, seize the day. Um, for me, it, that I mean, that's what I look at. I, I look at Chelsea or Courtney Williams, sorry, getting 18 shots. That's not a recipe to win. Having yeah. more shots from those two players um, versus your 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 legit MVP and your team MVP, if you want to call it that, Alyssa Thomas. Um, so just, you know, a lot of intriguing aspects to this game but i mean chelsea gray and and raquana williams just really stepping up having ridiculous games i'm curious for you as somebody who is watching kind of for me it was easy right you're not going through the emotions of it um but i'm curious for you you know i was just i mean it it was not the prettiest game las vegas had played you know this was not the prettiest series (laughs) las vegas had played you know you have to give credit to connecticut and just how um you know, disruptive they can be and, and had the way that they, they make the game look at certain times. Um, but Las Vegas found a way. And, and I, to echo your point about Raquana Williams, I mean, I've always been a huge fan of Raquana Williams and I, I love, you know, what she was able to do in LA at times and just the, her ability to score. Um, I mean, we know, we know anyone who's followed the league for a few amount of years knows that, you know, that's a player who, given the opportunity, given given the given the chances, given the shot, given the shots, can put up twenty five plus. Um, and that's you know not exactly her role this year. hasn't been her role with Las Vegas. hasn't needed to be. Her role has been more so. You've got to be a spark off the bench. You've got to give us serviceable minutes. Come in and give us, you know, six to ten, whatever that might be. Um, but it was really cool to see her, you know, have her best game of the season in a game where. Where you know Asia Wilson was struggling, Kelsey Plum, you know she finished five for twelve, and not not a horrible night from Plum, but like you know it wasn't like the starters were dominant. Jackie Young four of fourteen, so you know they're 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 starting five, you know they're, they're three headed monster if you will that you know averages ninety percent of their points. You know it was really it, it was a grind for them to get their buckets and to get their to get their opportunities, and so it was really um, and obviously Chelsea Gray, I mean she was great. But I'm talking about Jackie Young, Asia Wilson, and Kelsey Plum kind of having just average, below average, um, just offensive, you know, afternoons. So Raquana Williams to come in and do what she did, finish five for nine from the three-point line. I mean, it was just really, really, um, it was great to see that, see her step up in that moment, um, really seize this opportunity to, to secure this. Because if Raquana Williams doesn't do what she does, I, I don't know that this outcome is what it is. And I, I agree. It was very reminiscent of game one from, from Connecticut's perspective. And also Las Vegas. I mean, you know, this is a team that averaged 90 points a game. Now, game one, they, I think it was like in the 60s, something like that. But, you know, they end up scoring 78. But, you know, you hold them well below their average. You know, you've got, you've got their, their three, four-headed monster, you know, struggling at times to score. But, again, Connecticut just only able to put 71 on the board, um, it just felt like a missed opportunity. It felt like there were two games 
in this series, in this four game series that can easily could have gone. Well, put it, had. put it this way, Rachel, like, you were talking about the yeah. aces average scoring. There was only one game this series that the aces scored above 80. And I think that's mind blowing to me. And while you can, if you're, and, and look, there's two sides to each coin, right? If you're viewing it from Connecticut side, you're saying we went into the series knowing the only way we could win is if we mucked it up. And if we really threw Las Vegas off their game, really just completely, you know, just frustrated. And, 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 and I think if you're Connecticut, if you look back at this series, you go, we did what we needed to do to win in the sense of the style of the series that it was and how the series kind of laid out. They just didn't make shots when they needed to. They didn't convert when they needed to. And they made uh, the nicest way I can put it, some boneheaded mistakes when they shouldn't have. On the Aces side, you got to be ecstatic because going into the series, you know what they're going to try and do, right? Like there's only one recipe for success uh, besides John Quill Jones just having an insane series. And it was basically that the Aces are just going to ride what we're what we've been doing hope Raquana or Hamby can provide a little something off the bench um and just ride the the Chelsea gray wave which has been undeniably unbeatable historic epic and legendary this playoffs and the aces found each game like it it very much so looked like the aces approached each game as a series in its own whereas the sun didn't necessarily have that mentality. Like the aces went into each game saying it doesn't matter what the series score is. It doesn't matter what's gone on at any other point. All that matters is we find a way, you know, I always say scratch, bite and claw your way to victory. And the aces did that. They 100% did. They did. They did it across the board and they did it with, um, you know, we talked about depth. We talked about a short bench. That was kind of the, <clears throat> you know, the narrative all season. We know they've got the firepower offensively, but you know, if someone get, goes down or whatever, you know, like what, like what could happen? And I think you know, we talked about it on the stream that day. Shout out to everybody who joined us. Um, it, you have to have so much luck as well. You know, obviously, this team. I think I personally think, and I, I know you kind of agree, has the potential for to run it back to the potential of a quote unquote, again, potential is the key word, dynasty, um, depending on the kind of moves that happen in the free agency. But you have to have luck when you're talking about these things. Everybody was in phenomenal shape this season. Everybody put in so much work in the offseason to take care of their bodies, to get themselves to be able to play 38, 40 minutes a game with a short bench and a limited, you know, it was like everyone's goal was to get into the Las Vegas Aces bench. And if you could do that, then you had a shot. And I wasn't sure you know, if what they were working with could, could sustain an entire course of a season. And it did, you know, and that, that was really amazing to see. It was amazing to see um, how consistent this team was across the board. And, and it, it, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like it was, it was a super team in terms of the, the starting five, but like after that, it was like, well, this is scary. So, um, you know, I, the, the, the fun thing about this is I'm excited for, for free agency, not to get too far ahead of ourselves and see what this team can add but the resilience of this team, the chemistry of this team, um, you know, it, it didn't always have to be pretty. They found way. It wasn't just like, oh, we're going to outscore you. And if we can do that, great. They were able to kind of grit their teeth and, and, and have that edge to them. I think that they started to really encompass as more and more as the season went on. Um, and we really saw that in the Connecticut series, because again, it wasn't the prettiest basketball all the time. So um, really, really, really just impressed with the aces overall. They deserve it. I think that they were, you know, the best team in the league majority of the season. You could probably make an argument for the Chicago sky at times. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they, they're, they're the champs. They deserve yeah, it. No, they do. And you got to give them props. And look, something that makes me happy is how much fun it was clear that the aces were having throughout this whole season, right? Like yeah. there was that element there and it's just nice to see that. With, with everything in the world and everything going on and, and whatever you want to say in the W, blah, 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 blah. Like, it was nice to see a team genuinely enjoy their teammates, the moment, the moment and embrace it. And and you know what? Like, everyone likes to throw some shade at me, and and I find it hilarious, the, the social media interactions of people saying that, you know, we're super Connecticut biased and this, this, and that. I'll throw you a bone on that. Um, and I'll say shout out to the Connecticut sun for an amazing season. Like we can't just sit here and act as if the sun haven't had one of the best teams um, 
one of the best rosters, one of the best, co- best coaching staffs over the past, you know, X amount of years, however far you want to go back since Kurt Miller took over. Um, but you got to give it a, a hat tip to the Connecticut Sun, everything they've been through, everything they were able, the adversity they were able to overcome. Um, kind of, in my mind, it, it's very, very, very different. So I'm aware of it. But similar to last year when we saw the Phoenix Mercury lose, it was kind of expected they were going to lose. Um, but the playoff run and just the the adversity the ability to overcome adversity that we saw like i think it made a lot of people rooting uh for the mercury last year and the sun this year um but but we got to give a shout out to them um i want to push back on that just a second um i I was it was like okay i like the comparison with phoenix last year but i don't even think like i've really been thinking about this a lot the last couple days i don't even think it's like that close of a comparison because again Connecticut had two games they should have won, yeah. you know? Like, I'm, like, sitting here, like, they should have won game one. If they just – if Duana Bonner makes a couple shots, they, they you know, they, it's like I really looked at this team and thought, man, this this is going to be very clearly Las Vegas heavily, you know, heavy, and this, you know, maybe goes to four. They, they might sneak one in there. But I have been overly impressed with Connecticut in this series and just – I have been impressed, but then I haven't been impressed. Yeah. How close they were able to make the game and, like, didn't look good. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they beat themselves. I don't feel like the Las Vegas Aces in some of these games, you know, just flat out went and took it and they, they just dominated. It was Connecticut, like, literally couldn't put the ball in the basket at times. Or, you know, it was like, I just felt like they, they weren't that far away, which kind of kind of blows me away. Um, I felt like a couple games Connecticut beat themselves. And I mean that as a compliment. Like it wasn't like, oh, they're just lucky to be in this situation and they're gonna get they're gonna get steamrolled. Like <clears throat> a few possessions here and there and at least gets pushed to a game five, in my opinion. Oh, totally. No, and, and I'm not saying like, oh, like the Ace or the Sun should be happy to be there. No, not at all. These, these are competitive teams. This is a team that was the number one team going into the playoffs last year, right? Like, and the one game apart regular season record. So, we're, what I'm talking about is is this sense of like, and and I would even say to what your point was of like Connecticut kind of dictated and i already said this in so many words but connecticut dictated the style of series that it was going to be and like it's almost like i don't even have a good analogy here but it's like connecticut got to set the rules for the game but vegas was still able to win even though like connecticut was gonna say you know uh, you know what i mean like it, it, again, if you look at this series and you think about, okay, before the series, if you say, okay, um, the only way can, Connecticut can win is if somehow they figure out a way to keep the Aces well below their normal scoring output, they did that in every single game, even the 80, the game where the Aces drop 85. Um, they really were able, but then couldn't deliver. They, they, okay. they set the chessboard uh into a game that they could win and then they just couldn't get the moves down to win um and yeah i mean i i just think at the end of the day it's going to be fun to to look back and think about this more and more and more and and where we are is kurt miller going to be there next year is is john quill jones like who is this connecticut sun team it very well could be super similar it very well could be completely different i think rachel and i are both in the camp of like look in, in the same sense of of washington kind of trying to make that Tina Charles thing work like after a few years, like maybe, you know, the cars won't align, right? Like the, whatever it is, you, we talked about this on the ACES side, you need so many things to go right for you to win a championship, not just have a great roster, not just have great players, but so many other intangibles, so many other things go right to win it all. Um, And you know what? Only one team has those things go right for them that year. And this year is the ACES. Um, and it'll be interesting to see like what the sun team is moving forward. The other big news that I want to bring up, um, was real quick. I'm sorry. Yeah, go for it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I know cause I know where we're going with next. So I want to jump this in. Um, I just feel like with Connecticut, it does feel like change is coming. I feel like a ton of change is coming throughout the course of the league. We'll get into that here in a second with the other news, but I just feel like Connecticut and, and if people can, people can be mad at me for my bias, but this is honestly, in my relationship with Kurt Miller, whatever. I, I don't, I don't really care. Cause this is me being very just honest in my thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish that we could have seen this team 
at a hundred percent. And at some point, w- some, some way, shape and form the last, you know, three years with Alyssa Thomas out with JJ out with COVID. Um, I, I, I will always wonder, you know, what could this team look like at a complete hundred percent? Again, that luck factor of having everybody healthy and, and, and the makeup of this roster, the vision of this roster that, you know, the GM of Kurt Miller had put together, uh, we never got to see that, and I think it's really interesting to note this is a this is a franchise that has never had a number a number one pick. Like they've done what they've done without a number one pick, and I think that that is really interesting to analyze. I know we talk about John Cole's MVP, love it. You know, should the ball be rammed through her more? We could have that debate time and time again. But I just want to you know give my I, I, I get the sense it's an end of an era, an end of a chapter in Connecticut. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I honestly don't know. It just feels like change is coming when you look at the changing landscape of just how, um, you know, basketball works and, 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 you know, a team works and how that looks. It just feels like it's not going to be the same. So I just think that this was a really interesting era of the Connecticut Sun. They won a lot of games. You know, they contended every single year. And I think that, you know, Kurt Miller and his staff, um, that team has, has faced so much adversity. And I just want to tip my hat to them it's been really fun to to really observe the last few years and just study them. Oh yeah, totally. And I'll, and I'll add to this, like I think both of us have seen a lot of Kurt Miller hate on social media. Um and which is, ri- which is ridiculous, right? Like Kurt Miller, like we're talking about Kurt Miller and Becky both top coaches in this league, right? Like if we are going to list the top 3 top 5 coaches, I think both of them would be in those lists. Um but sitting here and, and, and thinking it, I'm going to push back at, at all the, the social media haters out there. Like, end of the day, how many teams do we know who have an acting GM and head coach who have been this successful at building a championship level caliber roster? Not many. And Kurt's up there. Um, and if you're going to sit here and throw shade at some of the like, I, here's my thing. When it comes to coaching, I think often people um, and there's a flip side, too, of it with Becky, where I think like Becky gets an unfair positive view because of the ATOs, uh, the plays out of timeouts. Um, great for like the positive aspect of it, of like if a coach like James Wade it gets the positive aspect of it also of thinking you're the greatest coach ever because you make the, you drop these great plays in these crunch time key moments, but there's much more to it. Um, and you can't just dissect a coach based on, uh a few ato like that's just ridiculous and also like at the end of the day and i think we've talked about this a lot in this series because i think this was kind of the achilles heel for connecticut is like players need to play players need to hit shots kurt miller becky can't go out there and hit the shots for them and if you have Dewana bonner going four for 11 if you have courtney williams going seven for 18 and tisha heideman going one for eight so on so on so on at the end of the day, if players don't hit shots, and, and we've said this many times throughout the series, if you don't hit shots, you're not winning games. It's about who has more shots made at, or more points scored, more shots made at the end of the game. That's literally what it comes down to, right? Like Connecticut loses by six points and crazy aspect, three more baskets were made by the Aces than by Connecticut. They had essentially the same amount of shots. So it really boils down to that. Um what I was trying to get to when Rachel had to interrupt me to get that, that little gem out there. I appreciate it. Um, Dallas wings announced they have uh, decided to not exercise the option. I believe was the wording they had um, of Vicki Johnson and allowed her to, uh, to walk shocking for anybody. No. Um, the day of it coming out a little bit curious. I, I like, I guess shocking in the sense of like it caught the WNBA world off guard is fair, but I don't think anybody's sitting here going, Oh yeah. Does anyone this... really surprise me out of Dallas anymore? No, because we all know the issue. It's Greg Bibb. Like it comes down to him. Oh, like he's an owner yeah. slash president slash GM slash like, or I guess he's not president anymore. But it just boils down to, you know, what w- the leadership of this team. We talked about it with the Aces, right? The leadership of the Aces giving a clear direction, a clear you know guidance, whatever it is, putting the team first. Yeah door of all types of coaches but at the end of the day what is the root of this issue and and again like they're different issues they look different every single year I mean I think we anyone who watched the Dallas Wings this season they went to the playoffs two years in a row 
I mean, they, you would say they were playing their best basketball at the end of the season. She's freaking coach of the month in August, was she not? I mean, she I was. No, 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 she was. And and I think the other thing is like they also were missing Arike and Satu and went on a crazy run. And and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Like when I view what the Dallas Wings were able to do without arguably their two best players, it tells me that like I give a lot of the credit for that to the coaching. So for me. It's like you saw what she was able to do when you didn't have the star power issue, right? The issue of like stars needing this and that and that. that. Uh, that's why I'm just like, okay, whatever. I mean, if we we if we could do a whole like five episode series of the players who have left, the coaches who have left, and other personnel who have who have left this, this Dallas Wings team. At the end of the day, like you're running out of people to point the finger at, um, and it kind of eventually it's like, all right, Greg. Are you going to take blame or are you just going to keep blaming other people? Um, curious for you, like if you're the Dallas Wings, um, you know, obviously like we're all viewing this from a perspective of like understanding the like the reality of the situation. But I guess like, all right, if you're Dallas Wings, who are some people on your radar? Before that, real yep. fast, I, I also can kind of understand it was very clear that there was some chemistry issues amongst players of the team, cough, cough, Arike and Vicky Johnson, you know, and, and, and I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that means. You could just pick up on it as a, just a casual viewer at that point. Oh yeah. Um, so from Greg Bibb's perspective, you know, if you're just trying to find a way, this is your franchise player. This is, this is the makeup of your team. You're just trying to find that right um that for that right leader, you know, who, who meshes with this team, who can mesh with this team the way Becky Hammond meshed with the Las Vegas Aces, you know? And, and I think that's kind of, that's gotta be the goal. That's gotta be the vision easier said than done, <laughs> you know, because I think that you could definitely make an argument that this is, this is a really questionable decision given, you know, just what Vicki Johnson had done the last couple of years. And just, so, I mean, I think that VJ will be fine. She's she should I would think have opportunities at other at other I mean cuz this this is just one domino of a carousel that is I, I my opinion is going to be crazy this off season. So um you know I, hopefully it's it's a great new chapter for her um because I think that she does have potential to to you know continue to to be a head coach in this league and 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 work with a team that you know, maybe even build a team up that you know might might make a little more sense than kind of what was from a chemistry perspective, not really clicking fully mm -hmm. in Dallas. Uh, but who are some people? I mean, I feel like every year Same you know, we, start these, <laughs> we start these questions and I'm not prepared to answer it because I'm like, oh, I, I always write an article about, you know, next potential WNBA coaches. And then like it's expired because I feel like all of them kind of get picked up or something happens. But I mean, I think you have to look at, um, you know, some of the top assistants, uh, you know, through the league, um, I think you got to look at Lat Latricia Trammell, LT, out in LA. She is a veteran coach in terms of just her experience. Now, does the alignment of Derek Fisher end up hurting her? I don't know, but I, I, I personally believe she deserves to have a look. Um, she's she's always been a players coach. She's always been able to have great relationships with her players. I don't know. Is Dallas a place that she should get a look at? Um, you know, you look at who are some other players and people in the league. I mean, Brandy Poole at Connecticut. You know, is she ready to take that next step? Is this, you know, someone who's ready to kind of step away from underneath Kurt Miller and do her own thing? You know, I know she's been sought after for things before, whether it's collegiately or in the WNBA. You know, is, is Brandy Poole a person, you know, that maybe she, she has roots in Dallas or roots in Texas? Maybe that's something, you know, that she could jump in, throw her hat in, the, throw her hat in there. I think, I think you got a Stephanie White. I mean, God, there's all sorts of names. I mean, help me. I'm just no, no, no. no. I, look, I'm uh, hot. In terms of, ex hot. I'm talking experienced coaches. Yes. Those who've actually been in there as an assistant, not just you know Lisa Leslie, you know who's a, who's a, who's a legend. No, I mean Lisa maybe. Leslie's only like even mentioned in the LA, and I still think you know Lisa and Kurt. Like, here's my thing. When when it comes to me, I view it from a much larger picture. Um, and maybe I'm like letting people behind the curtain too much, but I look at it and I go. You know, there's a few teams that have coaches on contract or like in contract negotiations. And I question, OK, are we going to see them in that same situation? Right. So I look at Noel Quinn in, in Seattle, where there is clearly a changing of the guards with Sue Bird gone. Does, you know, does Stewie want Quinn? 
because that that's what it comes down to right is like what does Brian Stewart want uh if you want to keep her there so is Quinn maybe an option of somebody you know someone who has the experience as a coach as a player um we know that Dallas wants someone who who has experience right and then LT I mean look Dallas is a team that's known for having a high octane offense and just lacking defensive stability LT is a defensive minded coach um Little T is pretty much set for DC and has already turned down the Dallas job a few years ago. Um, yeah. Stephanie White, um, I'm trying to think of, yeah, Brandy, I'm trying to think of a few other names of people who I think, I mean, I, I view oh, does Pokey Chapman. Pokey, does Pokey get another? get another opportunity? I think she should. Um, I think there's a lot of questions to go. And I think also when I look at it, I think to myself that, you know, there's someone who's going to come out of the woodworks who wasn't necessarily as highly expected because it's Dallas, you're not pulling, you're going to get somebody. And I say this with respect, but like when you're talking about a Latricia Trammell um, or some other coaches on that same level of hot commodity, but who's going to give them that first opportunity. I think mm -hmm. you have to think with Dallas, it's they're no longer in the market to be able to pull a Brian Agler, right? They're not in the market to pull, you know, a Becky or a Lisa Leslie. They're in the market where they can pull somebody who isn't the most high profile name, but has a lot of upside to them and could possibly shift this franchise around. Um, but I hope you get along with Greg Bibb because if not, that's my, thing, you know, is <laughs> because I think, I, I mean, I, I mean, Dallas is an exciting, you know, dynamic right now in terms of just the market, the players that the makeup of this roster, that how ag aggressive at times they can be. And this is a big, this is a big, off season for them. Um, so like from that standpoint, it's, it's intriguing. I mean, you get a chance to try and gel with Enrique and, and, and figure out like, what, what is this? But, but at the same time, like I, if I, if I'm a coach, I'm like, shit, do I want to go take this opportunity? Mm -hmm. And like, I guess you go into it thinking, Hey, I get two years, you know? And, and like, I'm probably going to be done after that because that's just what Greg Bibb does. And I'm going to get two years. I'm going to get my foot in the door. These opportunities don't hardly ever come by. So you have to take those opportunities as they come and just believe in yourself and go in there and just do the best you can. But at some point it's kind of like, shit, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I want to go work under Greg Bibb. Oh, totally. You know? like, like a red flag. It's a huge red flag. Huge red flag. And, and, and I'll add to that. Like, yeah, you definitely take your opportunities. There's a, a lot of, positive sides to this there's a lot of negative sides to us um and, and, and look we got a whole off season Winsider ain't going nowhere we got great WNBA coverage all off season we're gonna be doing get playback uh i don't know why i said get playback that's the link getplayback.com backslash room backslash Winsider. we're gonna be doing some streams for college games so rachel can finally pull me into that we're gonna be doing some overseas games so you can follow your favorite WNBA players overseas um but I want to take a moment um, before we sign off today, Rachel, to just thank everyone who followed us this season. It's been a wild one. I know for both of us, um, I had a newborn baby, which kind of impacted my availability for doing these podcasts. So thank you to Rachel for uh, always adjusting her schedule to my son's schedule so that we could do these podcasts. Uh, big shout out to all the writers, and the whole Insider team, um, but also to the editors and Chris, our graphics person, um, our lead graphic designer creative designer um and a, and a huge shout out uh, probably um most importantly to the followers and the listeners like we don't take it for granted that you listen to this podcast in rachel and i's mind like it's still no one listens to it and when someone <laughs> mentions that they did we're like so overjoyed and blushing and like the bashful gif from uh cinderella that is us every time anybody says they listen to our episode so we appreciate you uh, seriously from the bottom of our heart it has been so much fun this year um, as it has been every year, but each year it's always nice to kind of sit back, reflect and be appreciative of yeah, well, everything. Is this year five for us? Like we didn't even realize it. I'm pretty sure this was year five. It's crazy. Wow. Um, this crazy ride. We do these podcasts. We've done so many of them and, and it just seems like second nature. So again, just, just want to echo like uh, my, my summers are usually so crazy, but I always find a way to try to make sure I'm, you know, jumping on here and being able to do the playbacks and, and that, that has been a huge addition to what we do. I know we both absolutely loved it. Um, so shout out to, to playback and being able to just to watch and, and kind of hang out with the fans. It's just awesome. Um, just to be, be with other WNBA fans and just talk about the game and 
um, just appreciate you, appreciate your patience with me through the summer and my busy work schedule and cheers to year five. I think I've lost track, but I think it's year five. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, sometime soon we're going to have to either do a uh, FaceTime cheers or something. Maybe we'll bring some fans in. Um, but, sh- but seriously, like shout out to everyone who interacted with us when we asked for questions on social, um, replying to these tweets, replying to the podcasts, um, coming on the playbacks and chatting it up with us, throwing the hot takes, throwing our hot takes back in our face um, when they were wrong and uh, giving us credit when they're right. We appreciate it. Um, you know, we we are honored to be in the situation that we are in and we don't take it for granted. And we appreciate you and we're excited for this off season and uh, for more discussions, more debates, more guests and more more WNBA.